Hello everyone, David Flapola here and today we're gonna talk about language games. We might think of language as a tool to connect different ideas. So when we talk about the meaning of a sentence, for example, we might feel the urge like many great thinkers throughout history had to break that sentence apart into the elements that constitute it, logically analyze it, so to speak, into elements like logical connectives and or either or subjects, me, you, Socrates, and predicates, big, small, white, and so on. But were we to do that and conclude that the elements that constitute this sentence are what determine the meaning of the sentence, we would do something very important. And that's the context in which the sentence was uttered. Imagine the following situation. You go to the dentist. I'm horrified of the dentist. I just start gagging as soon as she puts her stuff into my... Anyway, so the radio above the door says, Miss Shirley. So when that happens, a woman stands up from her seat and enters the ordination. So you're in the waiting room and the radio above the door says Miss Shirley. When that happens, a woman stands up from her seat and answers the ordination. When you want to know the meaning of a word, the easiest way to find it out is just see it being used and you know observe what reaction it causes. Observing the situation in the waiting room, we, we could conclude that Miss Shirley means that whoever you know presented herself as Miss Shirley can now enter the ordination. So that's the meaning of the sentence Miss Shirley. Hmm. But that's interesting, it's literally just a name. It has no logical structure, so to speak. So where exactly is that meaning in that sentence? Let's imagine a different scenario. You go to the bank and the lady in front of you is asked what her name is again and she's like, Miss Shirley. Now you have the same statement, but in this situation it means something else. It means that, yes, I who am uttering these words, I designate myself as Miss Shirley. And that's very interesting. It's the same sentence, but, you know, in a different context, it has a different meaning. Ludwig Wittgenstein, one of the great thinkers of the 20th century, the philosopher's philosopher and this channel's favorite, proposed that when we talk about, you know, meanings, we should drop those old-fashioned attempts to logically analyze language as if it would be some rigid logical system that is just waiting to be fully discovered and rather focus on what he called language games. Roll credits. Language is a kind of game. I do something and then I expect a proper kind of response. This usually works because with people we are usually playing the same kind of game. But when we are not playing the same kind of game, we encounter communication failure. Hey man, how did you get your table so shiny? Polish. Oh, I I'm sorry. Jak uh, sprawisz? Imagine a construction site with workers who don't speak a common language. If they will want to cooperate, they will have to make up a sort of primitive language consisting of simple words like rake, wheelbarrow, uh, shovel. So every time I call out rake, that's when a co-worker brings me a rake. Well, the word rake doesn't really mean rake because nobody here can speak English. But we're simply playing a language game 
the game of working at the construction site. If somebody says, wreck, wreck, the rule of the game is that somebody brings a rake. I could have been saying like baby flopula for all that matters and they would bring me a rake. That would be the rule. If that would be the rule of the game, well, they would, you know, if they want to play along, then they bring me a, a rake. Uh, that's not a rake. Yeah, you got the point, right? Those rules, of course, can be vague. To imagine our language having strictly defined rules would be like observing a group of kids passing a ball and then saying that they are partaking in a strictly defined game. As soon as something remotely out of the ordinary will happen in the game, they will start to argue about the rules. Why did that woman enter the ordination when she heard her name? I don't know how I wouldn't... Why did she understand her name as meaning you may come in? Well, because she was playing the going to the dentist game, you know, everyone's favorite, right? Right? When a child is afraid and the parents say that everything is going to be okay. They're not playing the rational prediction of the future through available facts game, but they are playing the reassurance game. So if you would be like, oh dear parents, what mystical knowledge about the projection of the future have you gained from the metaphysical speculation of your thoughts? You know, if you would be like that, you would miss the points. You would, you, would, you would miss the point entirely because they are not really trying to convince you of some, you know, theory about the future. They're just trying to give you some reassurance. And yes, uh, that's a very gay example. Uh, would you even be surprised if I tell you that it's from the School of Life? It's, it's a nice video, by the way. Go check it out. But what is a game anyways? Depends on what we are talking about, I guess. Sports, playing with toys, betting games, what else? Oh, board games. Those are examples of games, but what about a definition of the word? Game, an activity that one engages in for amusement or, or fun. Activity or Athletics, a person or a game, especially a complete episode, a single portion of play, a single type of activity or match, wild animals or birds, hunted for sports, a group of swans. What the fuck, a group of swans? It seems that we will never find a definition of the word that would make everyone happy. Heck, we will never find a definition of the word that would make anyone happy. But that doesn't matter. We still know what we're talking about when we're talking about games. We don't need a definition. We need context. We need a language game. We could say that language games are the way in which speaking a language is a form of life or part of an activity that gives meaning to the language. And then language as a whole would just be a sea of overlapping language games. This doesn't apply just to words, but any form of expression, really. For example, sentences. When I talk about my ex, I, you know, I would say that it's she's playing games but when i talk about my um my cousin's uh daughter then i will be like oh she's playing games you know and when i will you know talk about my cousin which uh, i mean she plays she plays football for a team but she's always on the bench you know so if i will talk about her i will be like she's playing games Wittgenstein uses the following example. Consider this example. If one says Moses did not exist, this may mean various things. It may mean the Israelites did not have a single leader when they came out of Egypt, or their leader was not called Moses, or there wasn't anyone who accomplished all that the Bible relates of Moses, 
or and so on. Independently of use, sentences don't really have any meaning because it's exactly the, you know, the use, the being part of some life that gives language its meaning, the context, the situation, the, you know, language trying to accomplish something, a, a new bond or, you know, an action, anything. So if I would have to wrap, wrap it up, this would be the first point of this video. Don't be a grammar Nazi. Grammar Nazi, you know what I mean. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, water! Water! Are you deaf? Bring me a glass of water, goddammit! Oh. oh man, you should have said the whole sentence. How am I supposed to guess what you mean with water? <laughs> Imagine me going around town just screaming, water, water! People would be like, is this guy crazy? <laughs> Water, right? Huh. Yeah, let's take a second to talk about normative grammar or prescriptive grammar, as we might also call it. That's not what grammar is actually like, but it's like what grammar is supposed to be. So, once upon a time, London became a very important political and economic center of England, which itself became a very important center or Okay, the only center of the uh, British Empire. The way in which Londoners were using English became, you know, something that people, you know, strive to replicate because they were the, you know, the successful people. So people were like, yeah, I wanna, you know, if I wanna kiss the aristocrats' ass properly, you know. Mm -hmm. And I need to, you know, learn exactly how he uses the language. And that's when, you know, a ton of, you know, prescriptive notebooks on grammar or whatever it's called, manuals on grammar, um, you know, sprung up all of a sudden. And people were eager to learn, oh, how can I speak the London version of, the, the, the correct version, the, the, the highest version of English so that my aristocratic overlords will let me kiss their asses. You know, and that is literally the beginning of, you know, writing manuals. That's the beginning of, you know, normative grammar. Our grammar is the best grammar. You have to use our grammar if you want to be part of us. Or you are, are you a peasant? Are you a peasant or are you a proper ac across the aristocrat? Fuck me, I don't know English. This is very nicely summarized in this book by Steven Pinker. The language instinct would be the English uh, title, I think. But there's no correct English, of course. Languages are not some ivory towers with eternal platonic ideas that would, you know, say what grammar is correct or not, whatever. You know, language is alive and organic. And dictionaries and manuals only describe what language was used like in a certain period of time. But you know, times move on, and so language evolves to, you know, fit the needs and uses of, you know, the people of the future. First of all, we have phonetic changes, which are the phonological developments in a language. For example, uh, in English, it used to be knife and knight, but then this k just fell fell out because it didn't really have any pur purpose other than just making the pronunciation long, longer. So today we just say knife and uh, knight, I think. The following phenomenon we could call semantic change. Uh, semantics being the study of meanings. So for example, um, what do we have here? At some point in the English language, nice used to mean like silly or foolish, but then silly itself used to mean like uh, things that are worthy or blessed. And then awful things used to be the ones inspiring wonder, like um, the awful majesty of God and so on. Then we have the gay, which used to be like lighthearted, you know, like uh, bright, even happy. 
and then the word uh, mouse used to refer just to you know in an animal but today it also refers to that handheld device that we attach to our computer and that's where we get to our second point of this video don't be a semantic nazi that is a term that i've made up but i use it to describe people that dominate debates with their own supposedly correct interpretations of words they don't really acknowledge the fact that words acquire new meanings in different worldviews, ideologies and philosophical systems and with that they don't really let people with different views to fully express themselves. With this idea we come back to Rudolf Carnap who in the 1930s notoriously attacked Heidegger as you know supposedly talking a bunch of nonsense. He didn't really you know, acknowledge the fact that Heidegger was building up his own philosophical system and with that he was trying to manipulate words to acquire a new meaning so that he could express something new. But Carnap want, wanted to uphold the you know, consensus, the scientific or philosophical consensus on what words mean and he applied those meanings to Heidegger's philosophy and then of course he found out that you know, when you say that nothing, nothing, that that's a direct, you know, you know, a direct uh, transgression of you know basic logical syntax. It's just like when Thomas Kuhn, the prominent physicist and philosopher of science, read Aristotle's book on physics, and he was surprised to see what a profound idiot our Aristotle was. But only once he, you know delved deeper into Aristotle's philosophy, he could see the words as they were intended and not as he understood them as a modern physicist. So his view of Aristotle was polluted by his own interpretations, the modern physic the modern physical interpretations of words. But of course Aristotle didn't mean them. And only once he could acknowledge that the words that Aristotle used are something different than what he is used to, he could open himself up to fully understanding Aristotle. As the great Pornoponti said, philosophy is a process by which the stereotypical language transforms into something prolific, so that it can sing the world properly. Once we stop forcing our semantics onto other people and, you know, truly listen to what they have to say, that's when we are truly open to new ways at looking at the world and new philosophical systems and new ideas that have to be perhaps expressed a little differently. This has been another video in the series on philosophy of language. Thank you for tuning in. I hope it was very informative and now just some nature. I wanted to show you some nature. Is, is nature not beautiful?